Sure. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate people listening, coming up to questions afterwards. It gives me a good feeling that I'm actually teaching you something or doing something like physicist or something. Okay, so I ended last time talking about basically framing what is going to be done in this analysis. So let's get into it. I told you first that I wanted to give you some little bit of theoretical background about what TMD means. Okay, and I also said I'm going to only be looking at unpolarized TMDs. So um, this is kind of the definition. I mentioned at the very beginning that you need to first have some definition of your uh, structures in terms of quark fields and, and quantum field theory, not necessarily quark fields, but here, this is a quark uh, TMD. This is the matrix element that we care about here. So this is a this is describing the TMD with a tilde. I'll talk about the tilde in a second. Uh, this is a quark inside of a hadron state N. So N can mean pion, proton, nucleus, all of the above. It's a function of X, which is the same X that comes in the PDF, the collinear version. So this is momentum fraction, so to speak. And it's also a function of BT. BT tilde, tilde BT. Okay, just have that a little bit in, in your mind. I'm going to be really focusing on the BT dependence. BT is the Fourier conjugate to KT, where KT is the intrinsic transverse momentum of the quarks in the hadron. So you have this Fourier conjugate, Fourier transformation between KT and BT. I'm going to focus on BT. You might think, we're talking about TMDs. Why are we looking at a coordinate space thing? Well, it's easier to do the evolution, which I'll talk about in a, a few slides. And it also has certain meanings. So I don't want you guys to think only TMDs, only KT. I want you to think also BT. Okay, so let's get a little bit more into the definition. This is your hadron state. And you have your quark fields here separated by uh, coordinate space B. This is how this B looks. So it has some B minus direction. Uh, minus in the light cone, minus direction, and zero in the plus direction. I'm not sure how much light cone things have been talked about in this in this uh, school, but effectively, it's something like the combination, the plus component is the uh, uh, energy plus uh, Z momentum, the minus is energy minus the Z momentum. So that would be like a minus momentum, plus momentum. Coordinates is the same thing. Um, so you have this minus component in the, in the trans, in the separation here, of B of your quark fields. You also have BT. Um, you have this gamma plus here, as well as a Wilson line, uh, to ensure gauge invariance. But then you have some B minus a Fourier transform. So you have some X, which is your longitudinal momentum fraction of your P plus, uh, of your initial state hadrons plus momentum. So this is a Fourier transform with respect to the B minus. Now, if you look at a PDF, you have a very similar looking definition. However, for a PDF, this B does not have any BT. So for a PDF, you have your quark field separated in a similar manner, but with B only being separated in the minus direction, okay? So you're, Cor correlations of your quark fields is only in the minus direction. You don't have anything in BT. When we're talking about TMDs, now we introduce a BT. There is some transverse separation in your coordinate space correlations of the quark fields, okay? So we're learning more about what that means. Coordinate space correlations, B, the quark fields and the hadrons. Specifically here, we're learning more about the transverse correlation. Now, we don't really think of PDFs in terms of their B minus components, but um, it's much easier to do all the evolution for PDFs because it's a single scale problem. Here in TMDs, it's a two scale problem. So it's important to consider also the BT. I will be harping on this. A lot of my results that I'll be showing about the TMDs in BT space, not so much the, B, the TMDs in KT space, okay? So just try to understand that there is a Fourier uh, conjugate. So you can imagine that if you wanted to define your TMD is X and KT, then you do another Fourier transform with respect to BT. So E to the I, BT dotted with KT. Okay. Why am I talking about this? And why did I bring up PDFs? 
when BT goes to zero, you should recover something that looks like a PDF. This is a very important thing. TMDs and PDFs are not separate. They're related quantities. When BT goes to zero, you look at this definition, it looks the same as like a PDF. So when BT, you're looking at small BT, you should think something that is reminiscent of a PDF. I'll talk about that a little bit more explicitly later, but just have that in mind. This is a very interesting point. Okay, so this is your kind of definition in, in full, but not in full. Um, you have UV and rapidity divergences uh, that, co that come into play, so you need to modify what this looks like. You acquire these regulators in mu and zeta, where mu is your UV regulator, zeta is your rapidity regulator. I'm not going to go too much into detail on those, um, but this is needed for um, uh, renormalization. Okay, so let's look at the factorization for low QT Drellian. So as I mentioned, this is pion nuclear data. All we have is Drellian. So if we want to look at pion TMDs, we have to look at the Q low QT region. Like collinear observables, we have some cross section that is a hard part, and then we have times two functions that describe the structures. So here in purple, this is a TMD in BT space of your quark and a pion. And then that for the quark, anti-quark in the nucleus, also a function of BT. Uh, this is the so-called W term, which I'll talk again very end. Um, this is only valid at low QT. So I should really have something that says plus power corrections of QT on Q. We're doing this and we're, we're building up these TMDs in BT space. And you can see that we need to do a Fourier transform to get back into where the momentum QT of your data are. So QT squared here, e to the I BT dot QT. You need to go back into momentum space because the data are living in momentum space. But I just said, we need to think about the TMDs in BT space. Okay, that's why we do a Fourier transform here. Since we're doing a Fourier transform, it is very important to know how these guys behave at both small BT and large BT, okay? So Fourier transforms, when you take a Fourier transform with respect to something, you have to look at the entire range of that variable. So we're taking it with respect to BT. Now I mentioned on the previous slide, when you're looking at small BT, you should be thinking of things like a PDF because it looks a lot like a PDF. Large, uh, small BT, again, that's kind of short distance um, correlations. So kind of more on the perturbative side, you think of things like Q squared, large Q squared, it's perturbative. Large Q squared, small distance. Large distance, small Q squared, non-perturbative, okay? So you're kind of dealing with this large range in BT. You're dealing with not only the small BT perturbative, but you're dealing with the large BT non-perturbative. You need to be able to model these both, okay? So, that's the, that's the point. We need to look at all ranges of BT, and I want to make that very clear. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but I just want to show that these are the evolution equations that exist for TMD PDFs. Now, I'm showing this in BT space because this is where these are valid, okay? BT, 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 okay? This is where the evolution is more appropriate to be thinking about. Now, not sure if this was talked about too much in the uh, global analysis lectures, but you have similar DGLAP evolutions for PDFs, okay? And those are convolutions of your PDF at some input scale with some uh, evolution kernels. Those are simplified if you look at Mellon space. You do Mellon transform, you do your Mellon space DGLAP evolution, then they're just simple products. There's no longer this convolution. This is kind of a similar type of thinking. Since we're looking in BT space, this is now much more simpler of evolution. Whereas if you're doing this in KT space, this becomes way more difficult. So I would urge us to stay in BT space. Okay, I mentioned that there was a rapidity uh, regulation. So this is a rapidity scale zeta. This is how your TMD evolves with, uh, with zeta. This is very important quantity, Colin Soper kernel. This is related to some vacuum physics. It is totally uh, universal, depending, it doesn't, you can see here I have Q and N 
here as subscripts, this has no subscripts. This is universal in everything. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a quark, gluon, any quark, PDF, pion, whatever, fragmentation function. These things exist everywhere in all these evolution equations for TMDs. This is a very important quantity. And in fact, it has its own renormalization group equation, uh, which is here uh, with respect to a log of mu. Mu is the uh, UV regulator. And so this has this anomalous dimension of the CS kernel here, gamma K. Um, and then we can also look at the uh, renormalization group equation for the TMD itself, which has introduces now an anomalous dimension of the uh, TMD. This has some F, gamma F. Okay, maybe it should be gamma Q or something. This depends on uh, your what, what, what thing you're looking at, okay? This is no longer a totally universal thing, whereas these guys all over here, totally universal. Okay, so I mentioned there needs to be some relation at small bt with the PDF. So this is how we can write out the TMD PDF at small bt. It can be described in terms of its operator product expansion. And the way that we can write that is here. This is a convolution of some Wilson coefficients in the C tildes. This is a function of bt. Um, and we are doing some convolution of that with respect to the collinear PDFs, not a function of bt. There's some implied BT in the mu scale, but I won't go into that. Effectively, this is the way that we can relate the small BT TMD to a PDF. Okay, so there's explicit dependence on collinear PDFs in the formulation for a TMD. Explicit dependence. This has some breakdown at large BT. You can see there are power corrections of lambda QCD times BT to some power. So if BT gets too large, this whole picture breaks down. That is maybe not so nice, but kind of makes sense, right? At large BT, we're losing the connection with the PDF a little bit, right? Small BT should be more or less like a PDF. Large BT, you're digging into more non-perturbative physics. So how do we deal with this? This breaks down at large BT. We want to be able to deal with that. We want to be able to still rely on the small BT uh, description of your TMD. One common approach to do this is called the B star prescription. So instead of using BT here and here and here, we use B star. One common way to look at this is by BT divided by the square root of one plus BT squared over B max squared. So B max here is some kind of scale in B space that's effectively saying below B max, you're dealing with perturbative short distance physics, such as what I showed here. And above that scale, you're dealing with non-perturbative physics that should be parameterized. Non-perturbative things get parameterized and fit to data because they can't be calculated by first principles. Now, this form of B star, you can imagine, if you put in BT, let's imagine that BT is very small. This thing in the denominator, square root of one plus BT squared, this is effectively just one. So B star recovers BT. That's good because we want to recover this in small BT region, right? We want to make sure that this, because we know that this holds at small BT. So we want to make sure that if we plug in B star, we should recover BT at small BT. However, at large BT, where we know that this breaks down, we plug in B star and it becomes B max at large BT. So we're effectively freezing this to be at a point where we trust it at small BT. So we have different regions here. Small BT, we're dealing with perturbative calculation. The things that we trust at large BT, we freeze that because we don't trust it anymore. And we have to introduce non-perturbative functions. So because B star is not equal to BT, we have to be able to model the large BT region. We have to be able to model what is this non-perturbative physics that's going on. So um, the things that are related with the Colin Soper kernel that I was mentioning before, we can introduce this. Uh, 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 so I should mention that for the evolution as well, what we want to do is we want to replace BT with B star in all these. This describes the perturbative evolution at small BT. Now large BT, we have things like uh, the difference between the Colin Soper kernel at BT and B star, that gets introduced into this non-perturbative GK function, okay? This is perturbatively calculable, uh, and at B star, this is supposed to be perturbative, and at large BT, it's non-perturbative, it's unknown. So we have to parameterize it, we have to 
introduce this function here that, that does that job. So that takes care of the completely universal, completely general, independent thing, Colin Soper kernel. We also have to consider the thing that is specific to the PDF or specific to the quark inside of the specific hadron, whatever fragmentation function, whatever you have. These things are not universal, not as universal as, as the Colin Soper kernel, but they're still universal in that. And if you see it at Pion in another experiment, it should be in the same way uh, related. So this non-perturbative function here, we say we put this in some exponential form here. This is effectively taking a ratio of the TMD at BT to that at B star. So we say that at you know at small BT, that should go away, it should be one, because these guys will be the same. But at large BT, this guy has some now non-perturbative description. And that's how we 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 describe this uh, minus G Q. So this is how we can build up the TMD within this B star prescription. So this is the TMD as a whole over all BT space, small BT and large BT. Small BT I show in green. I don't even know if you can see it's green. Does that look green to you guys? You, you can see it's green. Okay, I can't see it. This, this and this, these should be green. No? Okay, sorry. Okay. Oh, that, that's a shame, but okay, anyway. On my screen, it looks green. Uh, this piece and this piece, the ones that I'm pointing to, are perturbative, okay? This is the perturbative description. You can see here there's a B star in here and a B star in here. That's saying that at small BT, you recover the, B, the small BT expect, expectation, but at large BT, you're freezing these pieces and letting this non-perturbative stuff take over, which is shown here in red. Purple? I don't know, okay. Um, in any case, this is the part where you have your operator product expansion. This is relating the TMD at small bt to the collinear PDF. So here, this F is the collinear PDF. Again, explicit dependence on a collinear PDF. You have some sensitivity here in principle. This is the S. This is describing all the perturbative evolution of the TMDs. You can see all those equations that I wrote was like logarithmic uh, uh, differential equations. You go back. You can... You can more or less solve them just by looking at these are more or less ordinary differential equations. So all these logarithmic dependencies here, we just exponentiate those guys. We put them in this non -perturb or the, sorry, this perturbative S function. This controls the perturbative evolution. Okay, and then as I mentioned, these guys are the ones that are non-perturbative. This, this one is the intrinsic non-perturbative structure of the TMD. This is dependent on the quark and the and the the flavor in, in principle, as well as the, nu uh, the nucleon or, or the pion, the nucleus. Uh, this is less, uh, this is still universal, like I said, but this is intrinsic to the structure of the TMD that you're looking at. And GK here, this is the non universal non perturbative Collins Soper kernel. So now with this, we have over all BT, we can describe the entire uh, TMD, but we parameterize this large BT components. So looking back to that one formula that I wrote at the beginning of this, the, this talk uh, was this uh, cross-section for the Drellian. We have the hard part here, the Fourier transform with respect to BT. And now I'm just fleshing out what these TMD pieces look like individually. So here on this first line, this is the uh, operator product expansion for the pion uh, TMD with its evolution and its uh, non-perturbative intrinsic structure. And then you have that for the nucleus you have your OPE for the nucleus, operator product expansion for the nucleus, times its non-perturbative TMD structure. And then you also have the non-perturbative piece of the CS kernel. Notice that I take that out because it's universal between the two uh, types of hadrons. So it's factored out there. So one of the things that I have in red, those are the things that need to be parameterized and fit. But I also have this kind of in a yellow purple box. This is collinear PDF, which is also a non-perturbative structure, right? So that can be also parameterized and fit. I want to mention now a little bit more about nuclear TMDs. Um, it's not entirely clear and set in stone how to treat nuclear TMD PDFs, okay? The TMD factorization does allow for this description of a quark inside of a nucleus. So if you have F tilde of Q and A, that satisfies totally CS, you know, the evolution equations, all the CSF equations. Um, but if you're thinking about this, these intrinsic non-perturbative structure pieces could change nucleus to nucleus. 
So what do you have for a tungsten nucleus? The, that could be different from a beryllium nucleus, from a lead nucleus, whatever. That's a little bit messy. And generally speaking, in, in nuclear, uh, nuclear PDF analyses, you don't do that, right? You don't have separate non-perturbative structures for each individual uh, nucleus. But you have a way to model them in terms of protons and neutrons and relate them to the free protons and neutrons, okay? So what I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in detail what we're doing here and how we're doing this model. We really don't have enough observables to separately parameterize all these nuclei. So we don't have many data sets for the tungsten, many data sets for the platinum, whatever. We just don't have enough to be able to parameterize them differently. So we relate them with the free protons and neutrons in this way. So we have our TMDs in BT space for the quark and the nucleus. We model them uh, from the proton. This is the bound proton weighted by the Z is the total number of protons in the nucleus. A is the nuclear weight. So you have uh, this many protons. So this is the quark and the bound proton plus A minus Z over A, the quark and the bound neutron. Okay, this is more or less how you would do this for the linear studies also. Um, we have an assumption that we're making here is that each object on the right side will independently obey the CSS equations. So for sure, the CSS equations uh, are obeyed with the left side, but the way that we're breaking this up, we're making an assumption that they each individual piece obeys CSS fact, um, factorization. Um, and we also make use of isospin symmetry here so that the up quark and the bound proton is the same as the down quark and the bound neutron. So we're only kind of dealing with now just a bound proton and in and, and this relation here. Okay, so now what about the TMD dependence? So what I show here, this is totally on the TMD level, X and BT. Um, what I wanna show here in practice is that we're using not only collinear PDFs, but we're also using a nuclear modification in the BT space, okay? So remember the GQ, is the thing that's living here. So this is describing your non-perturbative TMD of your nucleus. What we say is that it's related to the free proton times this factor here, one minus a n times a to the one third minus one. A is the nuclear weight, a n is a free parameter. So we're including now an additional parameter that's solely based on the nucleus, the nuclear effect. So the nuclear modification in TMDs. So this was also studied here in this Al Rashad et al. paper at PRL last year. Um, they found some result that I will show. I won't show their result. I'll show our result, but it's consistent with their result. But effectively, what we're doing is we're modeling some BT dependence in the nucleus. Let me just explain a little bit more about this nuclear dependence and why we're doing this. Again, we want to understand the nuclear environment because we're doing pion nuclear trillion. E866 data, the experiment here, took a look at nuclear effects by measuring ratios here. So this is a ratio of a proton iron trillion divided by proton beryllium trillion. Okay, so now you have some sensitivity to the target and its nuclear dependence as a function of QT. They also measured the proton tungsten divided by proton beryllium Trillion cross sections. We ignore any nuclear corrections. We ignore the collinear PDF. Remember, I said here this collinear PDF, this can have some nuclear corrections as well. We actually take EPPS nuclear collinear PDFs. Um, if we ignore that, as well as the TMD piece that I just uh, introduced on the previous slide, then we get the result bit here, which is not very good. You can see that the data don't agree with that. We can also look at the chi-squares here. For the uh, iron one, we have a chi-squared of 2.2. The tungsten one, 3.5. So not very good. So it's clear that we need to include some nuclear modification to be able to describe these data. And when we include that nuclear dependence in the, both the collinear PDF as well as the TMD, then we're able to get a much better agreement with the data. Now, I will say that this is mostly because of the TMD thing that we introduced. This stuff that I introduced here on this slide, this is the major reason why we're seeing this improvement. Collinear PDF does not do too much for these cross sections. And you can see here that these chi squares now improve dramatically. 
1.1 and 0.92. That's very good, um, especially with comparison with what we had before. So this is uh, effectively showing that there is some BT dependence. There's some transverse momentum dependence of your nuclei, your bound things, right? Quarks in a bound nucleon are different from quarks in a free nucleon. It's kind of evidenced by this. Okay, let me go a little bit more into the analysis. Uh, these are the data sets that we're looking at in QT dependent analysis. Um, these are all the proton data, E288, all the way down to E866, proton nuclear data, see that here. And then here are the pion data that I'm showing here, the bottom two. Uh, so you can see here, these are all fixed target experiments. Root S is all relatively small. And uh, this is all proton nuclear and pion nuclear data. So we really need to understand this nuclear background. All in a region of Q that's quite small. So we have 383 number of points here. Um, and like I said before, you have to be mindful of this QT on Q corrections because it, when that starts to get very big, then you're dealing with power corrections that are not appropriate to be using with the team defactorization. So we have this cut here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what didn't work. Um, these are different parameterizations of TMDs. Um, what we want to do is we want to explore this TMD parameterization. So these GQs that I show here, GQN, it's a function of X and BT. Um, it's not completely known what they should be. And um, we try a lot of different things. So this is really for the intrinsic non-perturbative TMD. So the one that's dependent on each hadron. So we try a Gaussian um, type of parameterization. If you look at a single bin in Q, you, all you care about is a few points in QT. A Gaussian generally does a very good job describing those data. Um, so this is a nice one to try to start out with. Um, but we're trying to simultaneously describe all of these data with a handful of parameters. And that becomes more difficult with just a simple Gaussian. Additionally, we can look at an exponential function. So you have here, we have an exponential minus something times BT squared, exponential minus BT, that's in the exponential. And then Gaussian to exponential, we can also look at small BT. You imagine that this is like a Gaussian and a large BT, this becomes more like an exponential. Okay, so we try these things and we have a certain problem to describe these data. This is specifically the E288 data. Um, the 400 GeV uh, proton beam coming in and hitting a platinum target. What we have here is a pretty good description of these larger magnitude data. These are actually sitting at small Q squared. You can see here in the legend is between four and nine uh, GeV and Q. And then there's a gap here. And then there's larger Q data. The gap is because there's a upsilon resonance. Okay. We don't want to describe those data. Those are not within just simple Drellian. They have other mechanisms that are happening, and that's why there's resonances. So the upsilon resonance is happening in this region between 9 and 11 GeV. So we want to avoid that when we cut those data out. But you can see that when we do this, we have a problem here with these larger Q data. The theory tends to overpredict these data by quite a lot. Okay, So this is unacceptable. We can't say that this is a good fit. What can we do? Well, we could, one, we can treat each region in Q separately as separate data sets and therefore having separate normalizations. You can imagine perhaps that these will go down with a normalization. Uh, and unfortunately, this is something that people have done. This is not appropriate also, okay? The normalization uncertainty that comes from your experiments are largely due to the luminosity. And that's totally an initial state. So why would we consider different regions of Q, which is just different regions in your detector, why would we treat them with different normalizations? The answer is we shouldn't, we should not do that. So there needs to be a better way to be able to describe these large Q data. Different normalizations is not the answer because the luminosity should affect them all the same, right? Okay. So don't separate them. Don't use them as different normalizations. What we tried then was to look at this map parameterization, map collaboration, map collaboration parameterization. 
Um, uh, this one was this recent work that I showed on an earlier slide. They have this super complicated form for the non-perturbative function. What this is, is basically sums of Gaussians. You can see here, there are three Gaussians here, which each has some e the X dependence uh, as well, and some interesting factors on each. This is a pretty complicated structure. Um, there are some people that may not like that because it's so complicated. Um, 11 free parameters for the for the uh, proton, 11 free parameters for the pion. I will say real quick, the pion doesn't need 11 free parameters. It only needs three, but I'm not going to show you those results. Um, they are the same as what I'm going to show you. Um, and we have another parameter if we introduce the nuclear TMD parameter. Now, there are kind of two camps. One, the non-perturbative function that you have should tell you more about the physics and the, and the functional form. The other camp is it's non-perturbative. You just fit it and you see what it is. That's kind of the camp that I'm in right now. Um, we take this complicated form and we just fit the data to it. And it turns out that this can do quite well with that problem that I showed here. It can actually capture the Q dependence very well. And um, um, that's, that's the answer here. None of these other parameterizations were able to do that. So I'll give them props. This is a good parameterization to use for the proton especially. And let me just tell you what these mean in terms of the chi-squares. So I have all these different types of parameterizations that I said, the map is in red, the Gaussian exponential and Gauss exponential are in green, blue, black. And I'm showing here for each experiment, the chi-square per number of points. Across the board, the map does better for everything, especially in this, this one, which is the e 288400 GV. This is the one that I was showing that had the problems at above and below the Upsilon resonance. But you can see that it actually does a very good job of fitting those data, all of the data. And also it does a good job for all the total uh, data sets. Um, these ones are not so good. I wanna ask the question, how significant is this? And this is a little bit of a, an aside, but this is something that I find very interesting that maybe is another pers perspective about global analysis. How significant are these chi-squares? Does it matter that they're sitting at three or two or 1.5? Are those bad? Are they good? Let's look at another measure. One thing is called the Z-score or the Z-level. This is something that maybe in statistics class, perhaps you've seen before, but it's effectively a measure of significance of your, uh, of your quantity that you care about with respect to the normal distribution, okay? So effectively, what your Z level is, is effectively how many sigma away are you from this expecting to be happening? So effectively, what we have is the null hypothesis is the expected chi-square distribution. Now, the expected chi-square distribution, you can look up at Wikipedia, it's a probability density function. So it just has some functional form and uh, it depends on the number of degrees of freedom that you have, okay? So you just plug that in, and the number of degrees of freedom that we have here is in each data set is the number of points that are there. So that's the null hypothesis, and the alternative hypothesis is our chi-score that we get. So namely, we plug in these values that are shown here. That's our alternative hypothesis. From there, we can calculate the z-score. So Maybe I should draw this a little bit. Um, so we have some distribution. This is chi-squared. Let's say that it looks like this. What we say, this is our null hypothesis. Well, our, turn, our, our alternative hypothesis is our actual chi-squared that we get. So let's say we get a chi-squared like this. Let's call it chi-squared naught. What we do then, we take that, we calculate the p-value, which is namely the area under the curve to the right. Okay, that's what I mean by p-value. And so z is related to that p-value through the inverse of the error function. So if you imagine you get a bad chi-squared, maybe your bad chi-squared is like this, and your p-value is really tiny, and then the inverse of the error function is quite large. So, um, that's what I mean by z-score. Um, and if you're kind of in a region between zero and one, two, three, that's probably mostly random z-scores. This is kind of 
thinking about in terms of the normal distribution, how many sigma are away from this being kind of a random thing happening. And what I show here is now the z-scores for each of those chi-squares that I put on the previous page. So now z-scores, this is again, how many sigma away are you from this kind of supposed to be randomly happening? And you can see that for these ones, your z-score is like seven sigma, six sigma away. Is that really realistic? Is that new findings? You know, in the kind of community here, in the, or at least the particle physics community, you might say, uh, we have this confidence at five sigma, that's a new discovery. Is this really a new discovery? No, it's just a poor fit, right? You can say that this is a poor fit by five, six, seven sigma. The map parameterization for that one gives a sigma Z score close to zero. That is actually a very good fit, right? It's something that is in a reasonable range of Z scores. Now, you can also see that this one, this E772, this is a problematic data set, even for the map parameterization. You can see that these green and black don't even appear on the board because they're effectively infinite. The Z score, the p-value, which I showed there, it's like zero, okay? You're so far away from what you expect. However, that data set, I will say, has some problems. I would say that the uncertainties are underpredicted. So I would attribute that more to a data problem. But you can see that the red, which is the map parameterization, has very reasonable chi-squares for the entire range. Okay, so we're using map. That's the, that's the winner. Um, now we can perform the global analysis. Now we can perform the Monte Carlo. So in JAM, I think maybe you guys have heard in the global analysis talks, there are different ways to do global analysis and quantify uncertainties. What we do in JAM is we do the replica method uh, in Monte Carlo, which effectively we do many chi-squared minimizations. And then we build a posterior based on that. Um, so we're going to be using the map collaboration for our, uh, map parameterization for our uh, non-perturbative TMD structures. Now, as I mentioned, there was explicit dependence on the collinear PDF. And I talked all about the last lecture about collinear pion PDFs. Let's put it in. Let's see if these low QT data can have any effect on pion collinear PDFs. Okay, so we include them in the fit now. We include all the collinear data sets. So that's 225 points of the uh, PT integrated Drellian and the leading neutron data. So now we have simultaneously, we can extract pion TMDs, pion collinear PDFs, proton TMDs, the nuclear dependence, as well as this non-perturbative CS kernel. This is the first time that this has happened. Nobody has ever done a simultaneous analysis of collinear and TMD dependent observables. Okay. This is new stuff. So we can do this. We run the Monte Carlo, we run off fits, we do collinear PDFs, TMDs. Up here, this is our collinear data, QT integrated Drellian, as well as leading neutron. Always we were able to get good fits there. Now we include the PT dependent Drellian as well as the pion, um, pion Drellian, PT dependent Drellian here. You can see we get a good overall fit, 1.15 chi squared and a 2.5 z square. So we're within this kind of um, two sigma way is not so bad. So what I'm showing here is an example of our fit to the pion data, pion QT dependent data, small QT. Uh, each of these curves is bins in XF. And you can see that we do a good job of describing all of them. And you can see also, well, you can't really see, but it, it includes the error uncertainty bands from the fit. And that's because it's a logarithmic scale and includes a lot of the data, a lot, all the bins, but this is also doing the Monte Carlo analysis and showing the uncertainties. Now, back to the question, what happens to the high on collinear PDFs? Are these data actually sensitive? I would say maybe not. No QT data. This is just the collinear data shown in blue in the background. And then when we do this analysis by including the QT dependent data, as well as fitting the TMDs, we have the red. Red and blue are maybe the same. They're really not that much different. Here I show the relative uncertainties from each. Okay, maybe there's a little bit of uncertainty reduction in the C quark. Luan looks identical. Valence looks identical. The conclusion that I have here is that the small QT data here do not really constrain much of the PDFs. 
Okay. I will show that explicitly why I say that in another plot later. Um, but just keep that in mind. Why would these low QT data in the fixed target experiments, why are they not sensitive to the PDFs as much? Just ponder that a little bit while I'm talking. But also listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so what I want to do now is to really give you some results on the TMDs. This is like a conditional density, what I want to introduce here. This is just a quantity that we're defining. Describes the ratio of the uh, two-dimensional quantity. So this is your TMD in X and BT space. This is basically what we what I've shown and what I've built up. And I'm just dividing here by the uh, integrated BT integrated independent uh, BT independent number density here. So effectively now I'm just having a normalized PD, uh, TMD, which is effectively to say this is the TMD of BT given X. This is kind of coming from Bayes' theorem in a way. Take this on the other side and you have some kind of Bayesian uh, number density here. Okay, so this is the resulting TMDs for the pion and the proton. I specifically choose this range in X, X of 0.3 up to X of 0.5, because there's direct comparisons in the pion and, and proton. Both have data in this region of 0.3 to 0.6 in X. There are two major conclusions that I want to draw from this picture. One, the pion, so this is BT times the conditional density, BT given X. So for each X, I'm just showing the BT. This is the up quark and a pi plus, up quark and a proton. So the TMDs tend to be less wide for the, pro, for the pion than in the case for the proton. You can see that these are a little bit more shrinked in the pion than in the proton. Think of what this means in terms of transverse coordinate space correlations. The pion ought to be a smaller object, right? You guys agree with pion maybe smaller than a proton? Maybe? Don't know. Okay, let's say, let's say yes. And if you don't believe me, think about the spin compositions. So if you have spin up, spin down in the pion, they have some interaction. They want to draw each other together. So pion should maybe be smaller. So this is kind of reflected on that. This is a phenomenological result. There's no, there's nothing saying that we have for sure the pion is tighter or the correlations are smaller in the in the pion than in the proton. This is coming from the data. So that's one observation. Another observation is that you increase in X, these tend to go wider. Same for the proton. So as a function of X, as X increases, the correlations in the transverse space tend to also increase, or their peaks tend to get wider. Okay, so that's something to think about. One way that we can also do the same kind of uh, analysis in a different plot is to look at the expectation value of BT for a given X. So effectively, this is just taking BT times that conditional density, integrating all over BT. So here we have some BT given X. And again, this shows a measure of the transverse correlation in coordinate space. Thinking of BT, remember, team, these are in BT space. Of a quark and a hadron for a given X. And this is what we get. Protons in blue. The dark, uh, the fully shaded band is for a Q of 4 GV. The hashed band is for a Q of 8 GV. These are proton. And this is pion in red. Pion, again, same Q ranges. You can see that for sure, for average BT for each X, the pion for sure has a smaller transverse coordinate correlation. For sure. In the up quark. This is true for all the quarks. Um, this is shown to five to seven sigma. You can see that the solid band is way smaller within the uncertainties. If you just add the uncertainties up, it's like seven sigma away. Five to seven sigma away. This may be a new find. Okay. Nobody has been able to show with this amount of uh, certainty that the pion is has this transverse correlations to be much smaller than the proton. Additionally, we see this interesting behavior as a function of x. Okay. Let me put it to you in this way. Let's first think about what happens when x goes very large. Imagine you have x going near one. What does that mean? The quark inside the pion or the proton 
has the same momentum as the hadron itself, right? The momentum fraction is one. That means it's equal. Pion, the up quark and the pion equals momentum of the pion. So if that happens, then you really don't have any transverse momentum. You can't because it, you're just carrying all longitudinal momentum. So you can't have any transverse momentum uh, for your quark. And if you don't have any transverse momentum, then if you think about a Fourier transform of that going into BT space, then we have a, a large transverse correlation in coordinate space be quite large. So it's the inverse uh, of the KT space. So if your KT is kind of peaking in a delta function near X equals one, then um, your BT space can be whatever it wants. So that picture is at large X, smaller X. It's maybe not as clear because now these quarks can have some transverse momentum to carry and therefore something in this K, uh, BT space. Let me just give you a possible explanation uh, that we thought might be the case of what's happening. So at large X, we can see that we're in a kind of a valence region where uh, only you have valence quarks that are populating the proton. So these transverse uh, correlations could be as big as the size of the proton almost. At small x, you have C quarks and gluons coming in. So now you have potential bound states of QQ bar uh, coming from this gluon going into the C quarks. Now you're kind of building a smaller bound system. So you have your BT here is now only within some smaller bound system before it comes back and annihilates back into a gluon again. So that, that would mean that at smaller X where you have C quarks coming in, you could have a smaller BT. This is a possible explanation. I think this is an open theoretical question, by the way. Okay, now let's look at the nuclear dependence. This is the final major result that I wanna show. This is the average BT for a given X of the up quark and a bound proton, which is bound in tungsten to that of the free proton. This is a ratio. If you expect that there to be no nuclear effects in the transverse direction, then this should be one. What do we see? Something that's away from one, right? Smaller than one. This is what we dub the transverse EMC effect, okay? That means that the average BT for a bound proton is smaller than for the free proton. So it's more kind of in the high end proton kind of thing. So you can imagine that this bound protons are a little bit tighter. These correlations are a little bit tighter. Yeah. So the question was, what range of nuclei are these data for? So if we go back, I can have uh, explicitly what I have here. So we have platinum, copper, deuterium, which is very small, uh, iron, which is in the middle, tungsten, which is heavy. So copper and iron are kind of in the middle. Platinum and tungsten are a little bit heavier. So we have a little bit of range in this um, to be able to get some good dependence on the nuclei. So this is what we call the uh, transverse EMC effect. This is below one within five to 10% over this range in X, which is sensitive to both ion, or sorry, protons and, and nuclei. Okay, I wanna focus now, shift a little bit more on some higher energy stuff. So I asked you, why is this not really, why is the pion collinear PDF not really sensitive to this fixed target data? And this is happening because if we look at this W tilde function, so this is basically the thing that happens before the Fourier transform, W tilde. Let's look at it as a function of BT. What did I say at the beginning? Small BT, perturbative, large BT, non-perturbative. Small BT, PDF, large BT, non-perturbative TMD. Where are these things peaking as a function of BT? Fixed target data, root S is 20 GV, Q is four. You're dealing here with the red. This is now in a region that's peaking largely in the non-perturbative TMD region, okay? High BT, the majority of this spectrum is coming in the large BT. So when you do a Fourier transform, the majority of what's gonna be coming out in the QT space, is gonna be coming from this large BT region. And that is directly sensitive to the non-perturbative TMDs. Whereas here, you can see that there's not much in this spectrum that is sensitive to the low BT. Not much is very sensitive to the perturbative calculations that you have in, in fixed target TMDs. 
So this part, whether you change this a lot or a little, it's not going to have as much of an effect as this non-perturbative structure that's peaking in the large BT. Okay? The opposite is true for collider regimes. LHC energies. This is root S is 7 TeV. Q is 91, mass of the Z boson. This is now specifically sensitive to perturbative calculations. It's peaking way in the perturbative region. Most of this is described by the showers of the gluons coming out, things that you can actually calculate from short distance, small BT calculations. Small BT, PDF, do we have sensitivity here to the collinear distributions? Maybe yes. So in these, uh, some other analyses kind of looked at that just to see what level of uncertainties are achieved. So this is Atlas ATV data. We have the red is the uncertainties coming from the data. And this outer band, which is very hard to see, this is the uncertainties coming from the collinear PDFs. Way bigger than that from the, from the data. So you can imagine if you were to do a simultaneous fit, collinear PDFs, TMDs at LHC, maybe you can shrink your collinear uncertainty band to get down closer to the red. So one thing that we're, this is direction that we're going, trying to do this. So if I take a look at the data, this, uh, what I'm showing is there just the uncertainty in the data relative to its mean value. Now, all I'm doing is I'm just varying the collinear PDFs from jam PDFs. Okay, I'm freezing the non-perturbative TMD structure um, and I'm just varying the PDFs. So you can see here, I have the blue band. It's way bigger than the uncertainties from the data. So what if we try to do a collinear simultaneous analysis in the same way that we did for the pion? Do we have sensitivity more to the collinear PDFs? I would say the answer is effectively yes. You can see here, this is even flavor separation. The outer, outer band is the D-quark channel. Uh, red is the U-quark channel and the green is all of it. We can look at sensitivity to individual quarks. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up now. I just want to have a few opportunities for you guys to think about some things while I leave you. Um, these are not really mentioned in this talk. There are additional ways to implement TMD phenomenologically. I specifically said the B star prescription, meaning that we froze the large BT behavior to be at B max. Chu Zhang method, this is a similar type of way, but you have to imagine that B star is not exactly BT at small BT because you have this uh, square root dependence in the denominator, it may deviate from BT even at a B, even in a region where you don't want that to happen. Chu Zhang method guarantees that it does not, so it's it takes uh, BT up to some B max and just keeps it as BT, and then it freezes it exactly there, introducing some non-perturbative functions. Uh, Zeta prescription. This is really done by these uh, Artemidy folks. Uh, so SV19 Shmami Vladimirov. These are guys that are really championing this. Um, Zeta prescription is a different way to implement the evolution. Also, there's the hadron structure oriented approach uh, called HSO. This is uh, built up by Ted Rogers, who is at JLab, um, along with some other collaborators. Um, effectively, this guarantees that when you integrate the TMD, you recover the collinear PDF. So it's a little bit different from what I was saying that at small BT, you should recover something that's like a PDF. I didn't say exactly the PDF, but it's something like the PDF. This is a way to guarantee that. Okay, so now the question uh, that was asked earlier, what about the full QT spectrum and stuff in the middle? The way that you can describe the full QT spectrum is by W plus Y. W is specifically the low QT TMD evolution stuff. Y is written here fixed order or collinear factorization minus an asymptotic term. What does this mean? Um, so you had the TMD at low QT, fixed order at large QT. There have to be some way to match them. So effectively, this matching could be done with this asymptotic region. So this, this thing here, as, as you go to very low QT, you expect the W term to be exactly the only thing that happens. So at low QT, this Y term should be zero. Fixed order and asymptotic go to zero. They cancel each other. Similarly, at large QT, you expect the fixed order to be the same. Uh, the only thing that's there the W minus asymptotic should cancel. 
but this is not so much the case necessarily in the middle region. Perhaps this is where this is something that's an asymptotic region is, is overtaking. This has never been done in phenomenology. Nobody has ever done a successful attempt to describe the entire QT spectrum. As I said, there's two types of uh, factorization theorems, and connecting them is totally non-trivial. However, I did show that for the pion case, we we're able to do the low QT as well as the high QT independently, which is not the case in the, in the proton because there were problems at large QT in the proton. So maybe we can tackle this asymptotic region and do this in the pion sector. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Um, also, there could be future experiments to also look at pion TMDs. So for instance, we could have the Sullivan-like process that I showed before, but instead of just breaking up the pion here, we actually detect another pion in that current fragmentation region which would be like CITIS on a pion. That would be sensitive to the pion TMD here. That would be also very useful for tests of universality. Okay, so now this is my last slide. Um, I think that there are some theoretical questions that I don't really understand. Something like this X dependence and the transverse correlations and, and X dependence. I don't know really why that's really happening that there's a decrease as you decrease X. That could use better theoretical explanations. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's very important to look at various hadronic systems. Studying only the proton is only going to get you so far. You're not going to learn QCD. You're not going to solve QCD by just looking at the proton only. You need to look at other systems that behave similarly to a proton, such as pion or other quark gluon systems like kaons or whatever. And in principle, lattice QCD could calculate any hadronic state. It may be difficult, but they can do it. Maybe they can calculate kaons or rho mesons or something as their hadronic states. And as I just showed here, future tag experiments from EIC, JLab 22, potential upgrade. Um, these could provide future measurements that could be useful for other hadronic systems. So with that, I thank you very much. I've enjoyed the time here. And uh, thank you. Thank you again, Patrick, for being here. So now I'll give you the chance to ask questions to Patrick. This might be your last chance here. <laughs> so let's take this opportunity. Thank you, Adira. I have a few questions, but I'll ask one for now. Okay. Um, so on your slide 75. Um, yes. Uh, why is, um, in general, the trend is that the proton is, the plots are like wider than in pion? Yes. Why is that the case? So my thinking is that it has to do with the size itself of the ion versus that of the proton. And so when you kind of look in the picture that you're in this valence region where you have three quarks and you can kind of traverse the whole distance of the proton, you have to think about what is the size of each. So the proton is certainly bigger than the pion because as I mentioned, the spin up, spin down have this um, interaction. So the pion should be tighter, a smaller object. So my feeling is that because of that, you have um, your transverse correlations in coordinate space need to, need to reflect that. And that is not something that we imp imposed in the fit. This was just said by the data. This is just a phenomenological result. And our interpretation is that this is physics. This is a physical thing, that this is less wide because, well, lines are smaller. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, could you explain how the uh, Bijroken um, scaling is related to the momentum fraction that we are defining in the DMDs? The sorry, can you, can you repeat the first part? Yeah, how, how the Bijroken uh, scaling uh, is related to the um, momentum Jorken fraction? Scaling? Ah, this is something I haven't really thought about. Um, Bjorken scaling. How is it related to TMDs? I don't know. That's a good question. I've never really thought about that. I mean, one thing is that it's, it's very important to look at um, the two scale problem um, with TMDs. There's some things that you can relate to, um, some things that you can relate like with PDFs and other things you can't because it's a two scale thing. I I really don't know the answer to that. This plot may be give you a little bit of an idea. This is in bins of different XF. So effectively something like different X Bjorkins. Um, it's not so clear to me that this ratio 
you'd have, you'd have to take a ratio of this and plot it as a function of x. Um, it's not so clear to me that this is necessarily scaling the same way that you would expect in like DIS. It's a good question. I never thought about that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I can add a couple of things. Well, one thing, um, very, very naively, the, when, when you have a little bit of QT at the uh, transverse momentum at the partonic, partonic level, uh, X block can in the IS now. This is what the, the, this, this is the yeah. So think about back to, to the IS where, where X block can is, is exactly the X of the of the, the momentum fraction of the parton. Exactly means that large large enough Q square, blah, 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 many other things. But in, in that context, now imagine that you also measure the, the transverse momentum of a hadron. It means that you're sensitive to the transverse momentum of the, of, of the parton. And therefore, the kinematic relation between X block and X. Uh, is um, complicated by the uh, the transverse momentum or, or, or the pattern just from for momentum conservation. So for momentum conservation in, the, in that naive context uh, leads you to um, uh, to say that X block N is equal to X, right? Uh, when uh, you have the, the transverse momentum that can also enter that, that relationship, okay? Mm -hmm. Weighted by uh, it's 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 the transverse momentum divided by the scale by the, the Q scale. So again, it depends how large in Q you are, how large in KT you are, and and uh, so. It, but but there is a little bit of kinematic relation there. Yeah. On slide seventy nine, um, you mentioned something about bound systems um, or bound states. Like, can you like maybe say more what you mean here? Yeah. So this is. I think this may be also up for theoretical discussion. Um, effectively, what I'm saying is that now for your, you know, you have to imagine this is going in the X direction or the Z direction, whatever your the direction that your hadron is moving. You would originally have just three valence quarks coming in and from doing all of the momentum uh, of the of the proton. But at smaller x, you are now sensitive to things coming up like C quarks. So here you have a gluon coming in and then uh, creating a QQ bar pair. And so you have what the what we're imagining is that this QQ bar pair will maybe be a little short-lived. And then as you go further in this direction, that these QQ bar will annihilate again, having this gluon. So since you're kind of in this region where you have this sort of QQ bar system, we would imagine that this is more or less something that's kind of a bound state because it's first creating and then annihilating again. So you can't go too far away in, in the transverse direction. This is maybe a naive picture, but this is something that perhaps has an explanation for a small x. So it's kind of a smaller system because you have to create and annihilate again. Makes sense, thank you. I would also maybe offer another potential explanation, maybe more on along the lines of like statistical mechanics, that if you imagine you're at small x, you're kind of now populating a lot more what else you have in the proton or pion. And so um, when you're taking the average of that, average of all your states, you're now kind of looking at things that are maybe hitting other components, other quarks, other partons that are there. Whereas if you have large x, you might be in a region that's uh, not really populated by many quarks. So you have, on average, have a larger region. But small x, when you have all these things ha happening, on average, maybe you can't really travel that far. I think it's an open theoretical question. I don't know the answer to it. And this is maybe just one possible interpretation. Can you explain me better why you choose to, to calculate the PDF uh, at the, uh, depending on BT at a given x? Can you... Me um, the PDF itself is a totally collinear object, so that is not dependent on BT. That's just X dependent. No, I'm talking about the analysis that you've done considering BT at a given X. Oh, oh, oh. If it was not a PDF. It's... Right, right, right. Okay, so this is effectively just to show this on a normalization scale, but effectively what we have is some quantity that's the TMD, function of X and BT, and we can write that if we think of this in terms of a number density, which is strictly speaking, not a number density, but it has 
number density qualities. If we move this guy to the other side, since we're integrating over all BT, this is now effectively F tilde of X, F of X. So then we have something that's like a probability density of BT given X times probability density of X. That will give something that's like probability density of X and BT. So it's like a base theorem. And why you prefer to use this definition? Um, I like to look at it because it gives us a sense what's happening at for each X, what is the BT dependence? So it's not that we're trying to necessarily compare all the sizes of different X values, but it's really more or less for this normalization purpose so that we can put things and compare things at the same, at different X's on the same level. And so we're doing this here. And then we're doing this similarly here. We wanna compare these different X's for different hadrons at the same level. And so we can just have this additional normalization to be able to help us with that. Uh, with how the, the TMD written in position space looks, in terms of, of GPDs, you have to go through the mess of impact parameter representation, skewness equal to zero. It's a non-forward matrix element, but you still end up with something in terms of BT. And you say, great, now I have something like a probability of the parton being at this transverse position, carrying this longitudinal momentum fraction. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the left-hand side here and I'm like, hmm, oh, well, that's not a, a non-forward matrix element anymore. Right. So can you talk a little bit about how the interpretations in this impact parameter space are different? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Let me go back to the plot here that I showed regarding the 3D structure. Impact parameter, I think BT is kind of a, maybe a bad variable to use to be describing both of them because they have different interpretations. If you think of the plane wave approximation, BT here in the GPDs is like um, your addition of your quark fields um, positions, whereas in the TMDs, it's like the uh, difference. It's a little bit tricky, and I wouldn't necessarily use the same variable. For sure, for GPDs, the BT here is describing from the center, what is the impact parameter? How does this proton look? for various X values at different, you know, impact parameter BT B and BY. For the TMD, it's not supposed to be represented or thought of in that same way. The BT here is strictly speaking, the um, transverse coordinates, uh, sorry, let me go back to the definition. Strictly speaking, it is this BT here that is the transverse separation in coordinate space between the quark and the anti-quark field which as I understand, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know too much about GPDs, but I don't think it's the same meaning. Additionally, you can see, yeah, as you mentioned also, this is, um, you know, this is the same hadron state here for TMDs, whereas for GPDs, it's not. Um, but I think that BT here often gets confused with impact parameters um, as in GPDs, but it's not supposed to be the same thing. It's supposed to just represent where you are from a quark and an anti-quark that annihilates and goes back into the same hadronic system. Um, so it's really meant to be coordinate space correlation only in transverse space of your quark fields. Um, I don't know exactly what the definition is for the GPDs. Maybe it looks something the same, but with different hadron states. Ah, okay. Here it's conjugate to the KT, the intrinsic transverse momentum of the partons. Yeah. 62. Um, so I was just curious why the blue point is giving a different ratio. Um, why is the blue point giving a different ratio? You mean for the, the two panels? Yeah. Um, well, tungsten is quite a bit heavier than iron. Uh, so I wouldn't expect them to necessarily get the same. No, I meant um, as compared to the other data points, which the ratio of the, for, for example, iron to beryllium, tungsten to beryllium. Uh, the other data points being above one and just the blue points being below one. So, oh, 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 um, sorry. Okay, that's a good question. These green, black, and red are all scaled by another factor. So, the blue is certainly below one, the green, black, and red are scaled by 1 1.2, 1 1.4, 1.6. So, they're pushed up, but all of them are below one. So, this is just for visual purposes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're all below one. So, that you can see that, you know, as I was saying, this bound proton information is that this ratio should be smaller than one. Yeah. yeah Thank you. All right. 
give you one last chance to ask some question. Otherwise, we'll just thank Patrick for being here. And you can stay around, yeah, and like and we can meet here back at 1.30, but feel free to stay, ask more questions to Patrick and go around.